2 Corinthians chapter 10. I found that picture I was talking about. That's your brain. We'll talk about that in a little bit, all right? That's where, that's where the imagination is. That's where images come from. So I want you to ponder that for a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And um, I, God showed me some things here a while back. You know, there's a verse. Somebody look this verse up for me. About the strange woman in the book of Proverbs. Where it talks about her ways are movable. Okay, somebody look that verse up. And we'll get to it in a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. The Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Which means, let me, let me just stop right here. Okay? Where is it? Proverbs 5. So everybody just kind of turn there and hang on to it for a minute. Does anybody in here besides me find... That oftentimes your struggle and your fight is with yourself. Who in here besides me knows that? All right. If you walk in the flesh, you do not war after the flesh. Does, that, does anything about that verse lead you to believe that you have the ability to fix how your brain thinks. Because a lot of what is being promoted as Christianity today is nothing more than new age, self-help, positive thinking techniques. Baloney. Okay? It is the idea that you can think yourself into... Uh, prosperity. There's a book out called Think and Grow Rich. Okay? Uh, back in the day when I did Amway, they give you all these books and tapes to listen to. And it's all about positive thinking. If you think you can do this, then you can do this. All right? And um, it tries to fill your head with all you have to do is think the right thoughts, which will then bring about the right actions, and on and on and on. And if you can just change your mind, then God will take care of the rest, all right? Or change your thoughts. Change how you think and how you see the world and so on. It's the idea that says I can walk sideways up a tall building if I just think about it hard enough. Okay? Can't do it. Now, your mind, when I said that, your mind just drew a picture of you walking up the side of a building. See, it's easy to think the thought and create the image. That doesn't mean that the image is going to work. All right? For thousands of years, men have carved out an image of a god or a goddess to worship. They put ears on that god. They put eyes on that God. They put arms and hands and legs on that God or goddess. But that does not mean that that God or goddess has the ability to see, hear, say, or walk with those legs and with those eyes and with those ears. Just because we imagine it, that does not make life true. Amen? And the Bible is not a self-help manual. It is not designed to get you to think better thoughts for yourself so that you can make for yourself your own reality. The Bible is all about the cross and what God's ability to do in your life versus your inability for you to do for yourself. If you could have thought yourself out of sin, you would have done it already. You would have thought yourself right out of it and, well, i got to tell this story. I know the guy who used to be Joyce Meyer's 
radio announcer. And I've told this before, but it just rings so true. We used to, he used to have a children's ministry and we kind of made friends with each other and we would go out to eat every now and then. And, and uh, he had the same appreciation for Chinese buffet that I did back then. And um, so we would eat together. And he was Joyce Meyer's radio man and very well paid. And um, he told me one day, he just startled me. My pot sticker fell right off my fork. He said, I'm going to get out of the charismatic movement. He said, it doesn't work. He said, it's a setup for people to fall. It's what it is. He said, now my wife, she does not agree with me. But he said, I'm done. I'm out. And it wasn't too, I'm sure he had a contract with Joyce that he had to fulfill. But once he fulfilled that contract, you didn't hear him on the radio anymore. And, um, but he told me, he said, all the people that he knew that was in it, he said, their lives were just falling all to pieces. And they were told that if they, if they did all the things that the, pre the preacher told them to do, the things that Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Rodney Howard Brown told them to do, if they said all the positive things, thought all the positive thoughts, and did all the positive things, then God would make them rich, make them healthy, and give them success in life, and everything would be fine. And he said, I know people whose lives literally are collapsing, they're falling apart, and when they go to the preacher to ask why, they're being told, obviously it's their fault that they're, they're holding something back on God, and they've not yielded completely to God. And they've got negative things in their life. And so God is returning negative things to them. They're told that basically it's their fault. And uh, here's, here's the truth of that statement. It was their fault all along. Okay? You and I do not deserve one thing that we have in our custody right now. We don't deserve any of it. It is by the grace of God alone that we have what we have. Amen? Okay? So all the amount of your own positive thinking and positive creativity and everything like that. Uh, when we were in Amway, they would take us out to do what's called uh, dream building. Which basically was covetousness under another, another title. Go out and look at, go and drive in rich neighborhoods and look at nice houses. And say, boy, wouldn't it be nice if you were in that house? That's the first thing that the law said. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Very first thing. And covet this and covet that and covet that. Boy, wouldn't it be nice if you were in that? So if you sell a lot of products uh, under our group, then you'll have that. You can have that, you know, whenever you want it. You just name it, claim it, and it's yours. And we were just constantly fed this positive reinforcement stuff that we, ha that we had to think this way in order to perform this way. And I have found, and even R Rick Warren wrote in his Purpose Driven Church book, that it's a fallacy to think that prayer alone can build a lively church. And I challenge that statement with the word of God. I think prayer is the way. I think you ask God and God delivers based upon his will and his what glorifies him and honors him and his kingdom and honors his word. James said you have not because you ask not or you have not because you ask amiss. You're asking, out, you're asking for something that violates the holy nature and the will of God. Okay? You cannot ask God, as a man, you cannot ask God to give you five women on the side. God will not, well, you better watch out. God just may give you that. Not as a blessing, but as a curse to you. Okay? It's like me saying, I'd, I'd be afraid to play the lottery. Afraid I'd win. Okay? And God will give me $950 million. And then all of a sudden now I don't have to trust God anymore because I'm rich. I don't want that. Amen? Don't want it. So, if there are issues in life that you deal with, and there always are, it is wrong to think that you can deal with them after the manner of the flesh. Your creativity in your imagination has nothing to do with it. It does have everything to do with you asking God and waiting on God's deliverance. That's the key. You ask and then you wait. 
What else does God tell you to do? Ask and wait. Okay? So anyway, verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is in your Bible. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of of Christ. If you want to do a good study this week, study in like in the Old Testament where like Joshua or David or Samson or any of these mighty kings or these mighty men in the Old Testament brought into captivity their enemies. Study when Joshua captured the five kings. Study that. That is that is you bringing into cap or Christ bringing into captivity Things that are against you, all right? And there's a way to deal with them. Uh, having a, a, in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. So, um, Revelation 13, turn there. And we show you why this is important, especially in the day... That you and I are living in right now. We are in the process. As a species. In this time and place in history. We are creating a God. Man is literally creating a God. Man is creating a system. And most of us in this room are part of it. And it just is the way that things are done in this life. There is not anything that you can do in life, except for, I guess, read your Bible and pray, that does not involve a computer. Even our stoves, our refrigerator, my goodness, even our crock pots. Our crock pots now are Bluetooth, and you can, you can operate your crock pot with an app. How hard is it? To get up and go turn a crock pot on. Back in the old days, we used to get up and walk across the room and plug it in. Good read. But I, I do it. I turned all the air conditioners on this morning from the house before I left my home. Okay? Or else it would be 90 degrees in here. Could have turned them on last night. I don't know why I didn't think about it. But anyway... In the time that we're living in, we're building AI, artificial intelligence. We're building a machine. And it's not just one machine in some warehouse somewhere. Because of the way everything is connected, it is the whole of all computer systems in the world that are the collective brain of this God. This God sees most things that we do. This God hears most things that we do. You have on your phone a camera and a microphone and a GPS coordinating system. It, ha it collects data on you nearly 100% of the time. It collects phone records, phone messages, emails, text messages, bank statements. It collects information on who you are, where you go, what you like, what you don't like. It is collecting a non-stop stream of information on you. How, how cold you like it in your house. How warm you like it in your house. Where you went in your car. It, it collects everything. And it analyzes it. And this collective machine is growing more and more and more intelligent. Right now... It is helping us make decisions. At some point, we will no longer make the decisions. It will. We will want it to make... Our, we'll want this. Man will want this God to make decisions for it. Because this God will be able to make decisions better... Faster than any man. Yes, Chris. Well, 
Wow, I'll have to test that. Okay? But we're living inside that system right now, and that system is growing. And we're creating this image. We are creating God in our image. And a God with our capabilities is bad. It's bad. Revelation 13, 13, he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should, quote, make an image to the beast. Where is that image going to come from? It's going to come from the imagination of man. It's going to come out of... A, sort, a certain part of our brain. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. How long? Continually. His imagination was not capable of conceiving of something that was good. And this is where, this is where man is headed right now. Alright? Anybody that's ever had... Any kind of what they would call now an addiction. Anybody that's ever had anything like that knows that that's all you think about. That's all you think about is the next time you're going to get high. The next time you're going to get drunk. The next time you're going to be with somebody. The next time you're going to lie. The next time you're going to steal. The next time you're going to try to conquer somebody. The next, it's always imagined. Always dreaming up. It never stops. So I found several images of, I mean, these are fantastic renderings of what your brain is. The left side of your brain is the analytical part. It makes black and white, yes and no, on and off, positive, negative choices. It is mathematical. It is strategic. It is reasoning. It is logic. It is what interprets what I'm saying to you into thoughts and understanding. But while I'm saying it, there is another part of your brain that is assisting that. It is drawing pictures for you. If I were to say Adam and Eve, your mind drew whatever your image of Adam and Eve is, that's what your mind, that's what the right side of your brain just did for you, drew you a picture. If I say David standing in front of Goliath, you have an image now of David standing in front of Goliath. Only a boy named David, right? Okay? Um, and anybody who's ever dealt with people knows, cops know this. What's your name, Cubby? It's hard for me to say that word. Can you usually tell when a guy's lying to you, Cub? You're looking at him, right? You're looking at him going, this guy's lying to me. Okay? The Bible says you have a conscience. And that is your personal knowledge of what you did. And these cops, they pull somebody over. Sometimes they can see their heart throbbing right here. Boom, 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 boom. Why is that? Why is that? They know, they have knowledge that there's something wrong in what they're doing. Something going on. Something ain't right. And it's just throbbing. It's just going on. All right? And they can tell something ain't right. You're sweating. Your heart's pounding. There's something going on here. They can read that person. You can look at somebody's eyes. If they're going to make something up, if they're going to tell you a story, you can see, you can watch their eyes. A lot of times when people are going to tell you the truth, they'll look up and to the right. It's because they're looking through papers and reading off of little note cards or trying to find facts and information that's stored in here. If they're going to lie, a lot of times they'll look down and to the left. Not always, but a lot of times. Why? They're drawing a picture of what they're trying to tell you. And the problem is that picture will always change. Right? When it's, it's not too hard to catch somebody in a lie because as you question them, the lie has to get bigger. And sometimes it's hard to remember what you lied about five minutes ago. Right? Anybody that's ever dealt with kids? Right? 
Just read them like a book. It's because their mind is drawing a picture. It's building an image of something that's not true. And that image will always change. So this verse here, Proverbs. Proverbs what? Uh, yeah, Proverbs, let's start in verse, chapter 5, verse 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. That's referring to her speech. She's a sweet talker. She is, I mean, there's a lot of applications here, but she is, number one, a church that will tell you what you want to hear. Okay? Except for the truth. And those who want to know the truth sit in a church like this and they're saying, I ain't going to sit in here for this. I'm going to have someone tell me how good I am because I know better. Verse 4, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. By the way, two things about wormwood. Wormwood, the name for it now is, um, what is it called? Absinthe. And it's a, it's a root that you boil like a tea, and it has this little chemical in it that, number one, tastes very bitter, and number two, it makes you hallucinate. Think about that. Hallucinations are right brain activity taking over. Hallucinations make you think that the picture that your brain is drawing is reality, and it's not. That's what a hallucination is. And that's what absinthe does. It draws you into a false sense of reality that has nothing to do with what's right and what's true. That's where she leads people. That's how she's going to lead them to build this image. It's going to come right out of the wicked imaginations of man. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Aren't you glad you got something sharper than a two-edged sword? Verse 5. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. The path of life is your Bible. It is your King James Bible. She does not want you pondering God's Word. She does not want you thinking of Bible verses. Okay? What's, what's my motto? Think Bible. Think Bible. In every area of life, think Bible. Think of what God would say about this. Think about what God says about this. Think about what the Bible is te teaching you and telling you and so on. She does not want you to ponder that. She does not want you thinking Bible. Her ways are movable, but thou canst not know them. There are churches right now who have in their backyard, side yard, whatever, on their property or inside their building, they have a, uh, a maze. And people will get in there and they'll start on the outside... And they'll say, now at the center of the maze is where God is. And you're going to walk this crooked path and find God. That's her ways are movable, but thou canst not know them. Jesus did not teach us about a crooked path. In fact, he told us to avoid that. Straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leadeth to everlasting life. So her ways are movable. Take a look up on the screen. It is the difference between God's Word written in stone or God's Word written on Plato. If it's written in stone, it does not change. God did that. The first record the first written record of God's Word ever on planet Earth was the Ten Commandments. It's the first one ever. Now, and God, now God was going to give Moses from Genesis all the way through Deuteronomy. But the Ten Commandments was the first written record of God's Word. And God wrote it on stone. He wrote it on both sides. Showing that it cannot be added to, it cannot be taken away, and it's on stone, meaning that it's meant to last for generation to generation to generation. God's word does not change. God, listen to me. God does not alter or change his word based upon your feelings, 
your particular situation in life, or maybe because you've developed in your mind this idea that God loves you more than he does the rest of the world, and so God will let you get away with things that he doesn't let everybody else get away from or get away with. That did not come from his unchangeable word. It came from the imagination of your heart and of your mind. It came from the right side of your brain. You did not read that in God's word anywhere. You did not read that you are so special with God that he made a special deal with you that he does not make with anybody else. You've got to meet Christ at the same cross as everybody else does, including me. If you write it on Plato, by the way, our flesh is as malleable as Plato. Right? And we change from day to day. Who in here remembers pet rocks? Remember pet rocks? You had one, didn't you? Had a pet rock. That was from the seven mood rings. Had a mood ring. Okay? That's from the 70s. Yeah! Is that silly, Caleb? Pet rocks and mood rings? Is that silly? Really? You have a fidget spinner. All of us in here are going, I don't get it. Spin, 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 spin. I don't get it. You know why? Because what was cool when we were kids ain't cool now. It's dorky. Okay? What's cool with these guys now, we're going, I don't get that. Okay? And you guys, if the Lord allows you to, to grow up, if he allows you, you're going to get to a place, you're going to look at kids your age, and you're going to go, that's stupid. Okay? They're going to, I don't know, 20 years from now, kids your age are going to be carrying boogers or something. I don't know. And you're going to go, that's stupid. And kids are going to be going, look at this one. This is cool. Okay. There's something that does not change, and that is God's word. God's will and God's way. God said, I am God. I am the Lord. I do not change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And get an amen out of somebody. He does not change. He does not alter the thing that goes out of his mouth. Ecclesiastes. Solomon said it well. He said the thing that God does, no man can add to it. No man can take anything away from it. It's established forever. And yet, man consistently wants a God that can constantly be reshaped depending upon the current trends, the current thinking, the current ways. I present to you a document called New Testament Greek 27th edition. It's the Nestle-Alan Greek text that is the basis for all of the Bible translations that are out today, with the exception of the King James. It's in its 27th edition because the first through the 26th editions were wrong. The 27th edition says, we think we got it right now. Probably in 10 years, they will issue the 28th edition, which will correct things from the 27th through the 1st edition. What does that tell you? It's movable. It is in constant flux. It is always changeable. It is Plato. And will always, it is like the imagination of man. What you used to dream about when you were 14, 15, 16 years old is not what you dreamed about when you were 25. It's not what you dreamed about when you were 45 or 55 or 75 or 95. Your, your imaginations change over the years. God does not. But we're living in a time right now where the churches now are all changing because their Bible is constantly changing. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. She does not want you considering the paths of life, which is the Bible, the unmovable Bible. Now I'm going to throw this in too. I always say it. Do not believe the lie 
do not believe the lie that the King James Bible you have now is not the same one from 1611. It is the exact same Bible. I've got a copy of the 1611. I can show it to you. I have a book written in 1850, 1851, somewhere around in there, uh, from the American Bible Society, where they examined the issue of, did, was the Bible that they had in 1850 the same as the 1611? And they sent research, researchers out to research the issue. And the conclusion was, other than changes in spelling and in printing errors, the Bible that was the King James in existence in 1851 was the same Bible from 1611. Meaning, the one we have now is the same as the 1850 and 1729 and 1611. This Bible has not changed. 400 and, what's it been, 5 years, 6 years, 406 years. This Bible has not changed in what it said and how it said it. It's the same book. Alright? Now, Genesis 11. Turn there. Mankind, what, and what man does... Is always based upon his imagination. Um, John Lennon. John Lennon wrote a song. Uh, what was it called? Was it was it called Imagine? You know what I'm talking about. What if Imagine if there was no heaven, no hell, all the world would be as one. Okay, his message in that song was in direct contradiction to the message of the gospel, the message of the Bible, and he knew it. I think it was John Lennon, one of the Beatles, Paul McCartney or one of them, that said uh, Christianity will fall we are more popular than Jesus Christ. And you know what? At the time they were, and maybe still are, and you know what? I don't care, because I'm not following what's popular, following what's right. And there's going to be a difference. So, young people and old people, quit trying to chase the trends. Quit trying to follow the wind. Every wind of doctrine, some people just follow. Whatever new thing comes along, that's what they dive after. Thankfully, God has allowed uh, this church to capture some people who were being blown around from every wind of doctrine. And once they heard the truth of the word of God, they stopped and they, they stopped right here. They settled. And they said, this is it right here. We're done. Okay. Genesis 11. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have, look at the word here, imagined to do. That tower started in their imagination. That city and a the tower. They said, Let us go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. It started in their collective imagination. And they were working on it. They were building it. They were on their way. And God said, verse 7, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all of all the earth. Notice that as man's imagination is constantly changing, notice that when God, when God did what he did there, he confounded their languages so that all of them were unable to communicate what it was in their heart and in their mind. They were not able to, God gave them confusion. He confounded them because they followed after their imagination. And I want to tell you that anybody so inclined to follow after their own wicked heart, anyone who says, well, I don't believe God would do this, or I don't believe God would do that. I don't believe God says there's anything wrong with what I'm doing. 
Anybody who says that, that does not come from their knowledge of the Word of God. It comes from their wicked imagination. And what they're doing is that they are in the process of carving out a God that does not look like the God of the Bible. We're going to start out next Sunday morning, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 4 is God's warning to Israel not to carve an image from their own imagination. When they did that, in the day that they made a god, the golden calf, who told them that their god looked like a cow? Who told them that? Did Moses ever say to the Israelites, I just seen God, he looks like a cow. He never said that. And God told them at Mount Sinai, when all you heard all the trumpets and you saw the fire and you saw the smoke and the thunder and lightning and the trumpets and everything, you heard my voice. Did you see me? No. Then how in the world can you carve out an image to me? You've never seen me. At best, only Moses saw God and that he only saw his backside. God never showed his face. And because of that, Moses' face shone so much, the Israelites couldn't look on him. But the truth of it is, you and I have never seen Jesus, have we? And yet, there are pictures everywhere, paintings of Jesus, that we have, I guess, come to accept. Well, that, I guess that's what Jesus looks like. And the truth is, we've never seen him. And I suspect that when the Antichrist comes, he might just look like the paintings and the sculptures. He may even look like the Shroud of Turin, which I do not believe is Jesus' image. Okay? There are no photographs of Jesus anywhere. And I think the world has become so accustomed to this image of Jesus that nobody has seen they're going to follow whoever looks like that. Okay? Keep that in mind. Yes? I know who you're talking about. Yeah. There's this new age guru that's being thrown out there. He's the, he's the second coming of Christ. And he looks like images of Jesus that you've seen in paintings. It, yeah, it's a setup is what it is. It's a setup. All right? Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessings on your word. Father, we ask God that you teach us some great and mighty things that we know not. Or Father, remind us of things that we learn. Lord, teach us, God, in these days. Help us to not be ignorant. Father, help each one of us with our wicked hearts and our wicked imaginations to cast these things down because they are exalted above who you really are. Father, forgive us of that. Forgive us, Lord, of making a God out that is not you. And help us, Father, to worship only you in our hearts and our lives. Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.